Welcome to Better Health Guy Blogcasts, empowering your better health. And now, here's Scott, your Better Health Guy. The content of this show is for informational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, or cure any illness or medical condition. Nothing in today's discussion is meant to serve as medical advice or as information to facilitate self-treatment. As always, please discuss any potential health-related decisions with your own personal medical authority. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number 22 of the Better Health Guy blogcast series. Today's guest is master herbalist and hero to the Lyme community, Stephen Herod Buner. The topic of the show is Healing Lyme. Stephen Herod Buner is an earth poet and the award-winning author of 20 books on nature, indigenous cultures, the environment, and herbal medicine. He comes from a long line of healers, including Leroy Burney, Surgeon General of the United States under Eisenhower and Kennedy, and Elizabeth Lusterheide, a midwife and herbalist who worked in rural Indiana in the early 19th century. The greatest influence on his work, however, has been his great-grandfather, C.G. Herod, who used primarily botanical medicines also in rural Indiana when he began his work as a physician in 1911. Stephen's work has appeared or been profiled in publications throughout North America and Europe, including the New York Times, CNN, and Good Morning America. Stephen lectures throughout the United States on herbal medicine, the sacredness of plants, the intelligence of nature, and the states of mind necessary for successful habitation of Earth. He is a tireless advocate for the reincorporation of the exploratory artist, independent scholar, amateur naturalist, and citizen scientist in American society, especially as a counterweight to the influence of corporate science and technology. His most recent work is Healing Lyme, Natural Healing of Lyme Borreliosis, and the Co-Infections Chlamydia and Spotted Fever Rickettsiosis, Second Edition. I've met Stephen at least twice over the years and always found him to be a strikingly kind soul. We wrote an article together for the Public Health Alert in 2010, and this opportunity to interview him on the show is a full circle moment for me. I'm truly honored. And now, my interview with Stephen Herod Buner. So your book, Healing Lyme, was one of the first books that I read after I was diagnosed with Lyme disease personally in 2005. It came out around the same year, I believe, and it was certainly a great resource for me. It is an absolute honor to have you on the show today, so thank you for being here. Thanks, Scott. It's good to be on. Yeah, I appreciate it very much. So I'm interested in what drew you to investing so much of your time and so much of your life and so much of your energy into the topic of Lyme disease. Did you have a personal experience with Lyme disease? How how did you get here? Well, I spent usually for about 20 years, I would spend six months of the year writing a book, and then six months of the year on the road. And over that time, one of the, pretty much the either the first or second question I would be asked from the audience would be, do you know anything for treating Lyme disease? And it just was one of those things that, it, because it hadn't really been in my frame of reference before that. And I suppose they were asking so much because I was doing some work with resistant bacteria treatment and things like that. And so I was really seriously starting to think maybe I should explore that. And then a physician in Vermont named Wendy Leffel, who I was friends with, really um, asked me quite strongly to go ahead and do it because she thought if anybody could really come up with something for Lyme disease, it would be me. And so finally I dove into it and um, I didn't have Lyme disease myself, though I'd suffered from um, chronic fatigue syndrome and hepatitis C in my 40s. And so I kind of was aware of dynamics of long-term chronic processes. But really, this whole Lyme disease thing, it opened up an entirely new world, both of in herbal medicine and just some knowledge, deeper knowledge about ecosystem shifts and what people are struggling with. 
Yeah, absolutely. And that was kind of my next question, given that you've had such an impact is, you know, how does it feel to be Steven Buhner and be such a powerful force behind really shifting the Lyme community and, and having a significant impact on minimizing the suffering of so many people around the world? I mean, you have really made a tremendous difference in your lifetime. And so many of us, myself included, are incredibly grateful for your work. And I have to imagine that that feels really good. Well, it does feel good, but, you know, you have to realize I live inside of here, and, you know, I see people, it's like I see people from outside themselves, um, because there's many heroes and people that I admire, and so the difference in orientation is actually does mean a lot. It feels very gratifying to have helped so many people, and it feels extremely gratifying to have really sort of pioneered a whole new era or kind of approach to herbal medicine. And those things are, um, it does feel very good, but I don't tend to think of myself the way the people outside of me do because I live in here with all of my problems and limitations and struggles, which people out there just don't see. We don't tend to see the interior of another's world or, or how hard it often can be for them. So yeah, I'm absolutely. very human in here, even though from the outside people see me differently. Well, <laughs> so, you're, so you're humble, but nonetheless, we certainly appreciate you in a big way. <laughs> well, thanks. Well, so, you know, that's one of the things, too, about this whole Lyme thing. It's like I, when we move through the various shifts of life, adolescence and middle age and so on, you know, certain things happen. And for me in middle age, the big shift had to do with loss of arrogance. And it's a difficult thing to deal with. But when you get into the Lyme, whole Lyme dynamic, unfortunately, you know, you start to come into contact with a fair amount of power stuff or arrogance or things like that. And those are things I feel quite strongly that don't have a place there because there's been far more leveraging of Lyme people's um, condition, both financially and for personal aggrandizement that I, I don't like it. And I, I mean, anyone who's read my books can tell that I have fairly strong feelings about that. (laughs) All right. Good, good thoughts. I appreciate those. Um, Let's talk about the ecosystem a little bit. So what is it about the environment and the ecosystem of the world today that's made Lyme disease become such a big issue? I mean, we know that these organisms have been around for thousands of years. They didn't seem to cause the same health problems or disease um, years ago like they do today. And so I'm just wondering in your thoughts about how the environment plays a role into the current state of Lyme disease. Well, Lyme disease has actually been around for millions of years. And, um, you know, for instance, like in the Bible or in a lot of older texts, they'll talk about a disease called palsy, which is really another word for Parkinson's disease. So it's been around for a very long time, um, all of these different conditions. And the thing about Lyme disease, uh, a lot of people now, I don't think they quite remember what it was like in the early 2000s where there was a lot of confusion about Lyme disease, not only because it was relatively new to medical technicians, but also some people it caused heart disease and other people arthritis and other people neurological problems. So they were starting to refer to it again as sort of the great imitator like syphilis had been. But really that's in the past there were all of those massive diseases around like that, they just didn't know it came from a single cause. And now at this point in time, population density and human encroachment on wild ecosystems is exposing people to a great deal more of the disease and their, the arthropod carriers but the more we destabilize the earth ecosystem and the warmer the climate gets, the more these things begin to spread into the human population. Simply that change plus the density 
of our population. And there, you know, on Earth, there really isn't any escape from global ecology. It's just not possible. So it's just a side effect of the foolishness of human behavior over about the past 500 years, actually. Yeah, I would I would definitely agree. I mean, I think the environment certainly plays a big role, not only the things that you mentioned, but the toxicities that we create in the environment, the chemicals and pesticides, and some people talk about electromagnetic fields and all of these other things. It just seems that the environment has shifted in a way that um, is just not healthy for us and that, that humans as an organism have weakened to an extent that these bugs that used to uh, not cause disease now can really take hold and cause more more serious symptoms. Well, that's true. Our, in general, people's immune systems are much less strong. Um, the food that we eat is much less nutritious, even though on its surface it tends to look good. And in all the way around, I mean, we've been fouling our nest for a very long time, and it's sort of, um, it's things are coming home to roost, and we're pretty much stuck with dealing with it at this point. There isn't any place we can go to get away from it. Right. So looking at the core protocol for Lyme, the items in your core protocol that came out in the first book, Healing Lyme, they seem to have stood up really well over the years. So things like Japanese knotweed, cat's claw, andrographis, um, those have really been at the core of your Borrelia protocol. What are some of the key changes to the core protocol over the last several years, if any? Well, when that first book came out, I mean, I was sort of working in the dark in a lot of ways because nobody really tried to come up with a comprehensive understanding of Lyme disease and what it was really doing in the human body. And, you know, it's kind of odd in the fact that, you know, one of the things that's always amazing to me is how incredibly ignorant I am and always will be. So it's like I... Back then, I have such a better understanding of everything now, but when I look back and I can see how much I didn't understand and yet at the same time managed to find an original protocol or an initial protocol that was so effective. And I, really the biggest discovery was Japanese knotweed root because it's so specific for dealing with Lyme. Cat's claws held up well. Andrographis really works for, I think, about 60% of the people that use it. But for instance, you know, sarsaparilla um, was a, an herb that I included in the first edition of the book and in the core protocol. And it really, as just after 10 years of watching the impact, I just couldn't see anything useful in it. So that dropped out. And in the second edition of the book, if you look at the herbal repertory for, you know, modulating the core protocol for more specific symptom pictures. It's a lot more sophisticated than the original edition was. And I mean, one of the, the big problems that I ran into even then was that especially among naturopaths and some doctors, they just wanted to use the herbal protocols kind of like they would use pharmaceuticals. And, you know, even after all this time, it's become much more clear that Lyme disease is so subtle in the human body that it has to be minutely adjusted from, you know, week to week, month to month, year to year to deal with it effectively. And so in a lot of ways, that understanding is so much deeper and the sophistication of the extended protocol is just, well, it's just, tremendously greater than it was back then in 2005. It's interesting talking about sophistication of even the information in your book. I've talked to several doctors and practitioners um, with some of your more recent books and the level of detail that you get into in terms of the cytokines and interleukins and chemokines and all of these other things that actually happen in the body when these organisms are present and then how the herbs uh, play into those specific changes that are happening within the body. Um, many times I hear people saying, I wonder where he came up with all that information because it's so amazing. Well, what I like to say is it's carefully hidden in peer-reviewed journals that are open access where nobody can find it. You know, it's, 
that, you know, I mean, in the last um, five medical herbals that I did, I probably read 20,000 peer-reviewed journal articles and synthesized it. And that's part of the problem we have with the way our world is structured in Western cultures about healing and medicine is that people get sequestered into these tiny boxes. And I mean, one of the things, even in 2005 or 2004, when I was working on the book that came out in 2005, was that there was so much information there, but doctors didn't have it simply because they wouldn't take the time to sit down and read what was there. And the CDC was obviously not doing that either. So the Lyme is such a holistic kind of disease and that it affects the whole organism that it was only this massive broad range look at not only the peer reviewed journals that were out there. And I, I emphasize that because I knew one of the major groups that would be reading this would be physicians who just didn't have time to do the research themselves, and they needed to know that it was grounded in their kind of reality, but also looking at what was the experiences of people um, taking these herbs when they were trying to treat themselves, all the things they were experimenting with, what was the history of these herbal medicines in treating identical situations and coming up with a comprehensive thing. So people that people express amazement about the depth of research and the integration and the synthesis that I went into. I mean, it's a nice compliment for me, but the problem is that should be standard practice throughout the whole healing profession. The whole focus of this really is to heal people and help people get better that are struggling not to have one's pet theory or one's pet orientation toward healing be the dominant factor that that handles it. And as you well know, the majority of people that go into traditional medical technology to try to get healed with Lyme in general don't experience good results. They're usually treated shabbily. Quite often they're denigrated or insulted. And it, in the research shows it takes about two and a half years and a minimum of five doctors before people even begin to get help. So, you know, I consider what I've done here pretty much to be the way, the perfect blend of herbalism and medical technology and pretty much the way it should be as the fundamental, <laughs> just the place to begin. Right, right. Yeah, fantastic. Very, very good points. So let's talk a little bit about co-infections. So co-infections in Lyme, things like Bartonella, Babesia, for many people, those seem to be the more symptom-producing organisms. And I know you've done a lot of research on these as well. For Babesia, you've talked about Cryptolepis, Alcornia, uh, Ceta Acuta. I've seen companies that have taken your, uh, many companies actually, that have taken your work and put products together. I know there's one company that has all three of those in one uh, one formula for people. So are those still your top choices for Babesia? My number one thing for Babesia is Cryptolepis. I mean, uh, you know, and the others, I know people like to, American herbalists are like, and a lot of people are that the more stuff you get in the pill, the better it's going to be for you, you know? <laughs> and, and in some cases, you know, there's a really, nice synergy that happens when you combine certain herbal medicines together. Like if you add licorice to a blend, it tends to more potently activate in the body those other, whatever other herbs you've put in there. Cryptolepis is, I think, one of the great major herbal discoveries for Western practice. I mean, of course, it's been known in Africa for centuries, if not millennia, but Um, It's a very good broad spectrum um, antibacterial. It was specific for malaria is how they first got onto it. Um, But Babesia is so similar to malaria in so many ways that I particularly like it. Cryptolepis is the first sort of approach to Babesia 
for a lot of people, that's all it takes. It clears it up. And then if it doesn't, because for whatever reason, the body's not and the organism isn't responding, then you start to moderate it by maybe using CETA instead or using CETA with cryptolepis or coming up with a combination that's more specific. But I'm, you know, I really, that's, it's just one of my favorite herbs and I'm a huge fan. And so I don't actually like to mix it with other stuff unless you have to. Okay. Yeah. Very, very good. That's interesting insights. So let's talk then a little bit about Bartonella. So I know you have talked about CETA for Bartonella. There's a whole protocol in the books with things like Hawthorne, Japanese knotweed. You've talked about Hotunia, uh, milk thistle, EGCG. Do you generally, um, think that people should use all of those things or do people pick and choose with their doctors which herbs uh, they want to incorporate what are your latest thoughts on bartonella well people always have to pick and choose that's just the way people are i mean so and one of the things i continually say in all of the books is for people to you know those protocols are there as a starting place for people. And I have really good rationales for why each herb is included and what it will do to help the particular um, symptom picture that that organism is causing, but that they really need to experiment and explore and find what works for them. So a lot of people just, they kind of see it as their sort of go-to first herb for Bartonella you know, and then they may start to add in other things. And I, I think that's fine. The reason why all of those herbs were put together like that is because Bardanella causes a range of uh, damage, certain kinds of damage in the body with a certain kind of symptom picture that emerges. And each one of those things is, you know, will address each part of the symptom picture, but not everybody has the full range. Not everybody needs all of those. You know, I mean, one of the things that we're dealing with in the Lyme world, and you know this very well, Scott, you've been involved in it for a long time, is that we live in a period of time where people want one picture answers. And, you know, I mean, Bucky Fuller once put it, he said, people have a monological propensity for one picture answers. The problem is that in the universe, one picture answers don't exist. And, you know, it's kind of coming out of the whole medical paradigm, which isn't actually a very good paradigm, which is, oh, he has an infection, let's give him an antibiotic. So it's like this sort of, you know, we'll do this and kill it and then we'll all be fine. But when you get into these things, you're looking at a more subtle modulation of dynamics. So even though I can come up with all of these these suggestions, which have a really good grounding for why, really good rationale, that you still have to pay attention to the person that's right in front of you, the symptom that's right in front of you, and then begin to modulate it. So again, the protocols are just a place to start. And then from that moment on, you have to pay very close attention to how each person or yourself is responding and then begin to modulate it over time. So that's a good good next question. You talk about modulating over time. So do you think that when it comes to Borrelia, Bartonella, Babesia, all of these organisms that people commonly have with Lyme, do you think that we can eliminate these organisms? Or do you think that it's something that we manage over time? And is it even a prerequisite for health to be able to eliminate all of these microbes? What are your thoughts on that? I, I kind of gave up a long time ago the idea of a war against microbes because, you know, the doctors started that back in the 20s and the 30s and especially the 40s. You know, they declared war on these guys. And look, microbes are 4 billion years older than we are. So it was kind of really stupid. And part of the reason we have the rise of resistant bacteria is that whole mindset. For me, I wanted to understand their function and how they thought. They're highly intelligent and what they're doing in the body. So I don't generally think of um, my approach as being to kill them all off and eliminate them from the body because we have at least two pounds of our body weight as microorganisms, if not a lot more. 
A lot of the bacteria that we have are important co-evolutionary partners to us. So what I do is I look at eliminating, sort of like setting limits on their behavior, you might say. So for me, with having hepatitis C and severe chronic fatigue from Epstein-Barr, you know, those things are still in my body and they serve as a really good sort of um, traffic signal. If I start working too hard and I get too exhausted, those chronic fatigue symptoms will begin to recur, which forces me into a different behavior pattern. So, you know, when you think about this dealing with these organisms, if you, that's why using herbs that modulate the immune system and shut down the cytokine response in the body that those organisms initiate, if you shut all that stuff down, then, and you don't have any symptoms, what does it really matter whether you've gotten rid of the organisms or not? And um, I'm more interested in bringing people back to sort of an optimum health and vitality rather than some theoretical framework of killing them all off. The bacterial theory of disease isn't really as accurate as people in the 20s and 30s have insisted that it was. Um, really what's true is some people get Lyme disease and they have very few or no symptoms simply because their immune system is so vital. Other people get a fine, fairly minor infection and they're debilitated from very few organisms because their immune system's poor. So yeah, I think we need to move into a very different view of disease and AIDS, I think, was sort of the first one of these sort of stealth infections that began to show that our picture of disease and healing was wrong. And Lyme disease and these co-infections has taken it even further. We have to get out of the 19th and early 20th century thinking because it isn't accurate to the world. I 100% agree with everything that you just said and resonate with that completely. And the reason I often ask that question is because I think so many people that are dealing with Lyme disease have an idea that they can kill themselves back to health, just killing microbes, killing microbes, killing microbes. And they're not looking at the complexity of the things that you're talking about, immune modulation. Oftentimes when I'm thinking about things like detoxification, supporting the organs of elimination, all of those things. And so I think it's absolutely true that... Um, getting rid of every microbe is not a prerequisite for health and an absence of symptoms. And I think it's an important message to get across to people. And so thank you for those comments. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, it's really comes a lot from pharmaceutical advertising and sort of the pharmaceutical myth. And that's a real problem we have in the United States because pharmaceuticals sell one picture answers continually. If you're depressed, take this. If you're shy, take that. If you have a heart thing, take this. And what they really want is people to take these things for the rest of their life. They're interested in sort of, it's kind of using like a chemical straitjacket to force a certain kind of behavioral outcome in the body. But that sort of thinking has permeated everything. And as and you've seen the people in the Lyme disease, community see it all the time. Somebody gets sick, they are in that frame of thought, so they go to their doctor, they want a shot, then they'll be well, and they can continue to live and do their life the way they did before. Now, about for half of the people, you know, that's going to work. For the other half, no, it isn't. And so then they go through this transition process, which soon they end up in rage because they've been lied to and they figured it out and they spent all this money. They're still not well. And finally, 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 they go, huh, I wonder if herbs would work or I wonder if acupuncture would help. And they break out of the system and start to really explore and find for themselves what health is. And that's one of the greatest gifts that Lyme disease has given everybody. It's breaking the old system not only externally, but internal thought patterns. I mean, this group of stealth infections, the Lyme disease complex, has been one of my greatest teachers that I've ever encountered since I began studying anything. I've learned more about myself, the world, other people. Every, I mean, herbs, it's just, they're stunning teachers. 
I, <laughs> I would have to 100% agree with you again. And it's interesting your comment about people wanting to, you know, do something quick to get back to the life that they had before. You know, my observation with my own illness was the life that I had before was a contributor to the reason that I got sick. And so if I was going to go back to living life the way that I lived it before, I wasn't going to really be able to achieve a long-term state of health. And I think a lot of the message in Lyme disease is really to uh, help us treat ourselves better and look at the things that we were doing that were also contributors to becoming ill in the first place. I mean, that's one of the real massive lessons of a chronic disease. You know, and the the image I've liked for ever since I heard about it in my 20s was a guy goes to a psychiatrist and the guy, you know, the, his, he's got his hand on his leg and his, his left hand and his right hand is in the form of a fist and he's smashing his thumb against his knee right and he goes doctor i have this terrible pain in my thumb and the the psychiatrist goes well quit hitting your thumb he goes "Uh, i'm not hitting my thumb and that's (laughs) you know it's like that sums up our old kind of way of being that this self-examination we're forced into is very unpleasant but nevertheless there's this wonderful life that begins to emerge on the other side of it when we are forced out of our old patterns. So you're really right about that, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I almost hesitate to to even ask about one more micro before I move on to some other things, but I will because I wanted to get a little bit of your thoughts about mycoplasma. That's another one that seems very common in people with Lyme. I think we probably get exposed to mycoplasma more than we do some of these other bugs. It's not not necessarily a difficult one to come into contact with. And so for mycoplasma, you mentioned things like Isatis, Hotunia, Ceda. You've talked about the fermented wheat germ. And it's interesting that there seems like there's a lot of overlap between some of the things in the protocol for mycoplasma and then also the ones for Bartonella. So is that is that just because some of these are broad spectrum or is it because there's some similarity between the Bartonellas and the mycoplasmas? Well, the, see, the part of the real problem that we have in the Lyme disease world is the word Lyme disease. I mean, Borrelia were the first organisms that were identified, but what we're really looking at is a stealth microbe complex that are spread by biting insects, okay? So, all of these organisms live together in tick bodies and in various other biting um, insects, and they're very closely related in many ways, and they share, they share infection strategies. And most people don't understand the, the bacterial world is extremely complex. They're extremely um, promiscuous with each other. They share a lot. They have a lot of culture in common. They have common language and tool-making capacity, and we're not used to thinking of them as a really sophisticated civilizational complex, but in fact, they are. So because these organisms have been inside ticks and various other things for so many millions of years, they have very similar infection strategies. Uh, A lot of the stuff about them is very similar. So then you get to treatment, and because they use some of the same inflammation strategies in the body, the same herbs will be good for them. Also, some of the herbs tend to be more broad spectrum against multiple organisms. So you get kind of both of those things together. But, But a third thing is really the infection strategy for a lot of stealth organisms like this is really similar. They they get into the body and then they begin, you know, attacking certain cellular structures because those allow them to penetrate more deeply in the body as they get carried through the blood. And so that's part of the thing. They have a common infection strategy. And then when you get to their symptom picture, it's all, it's, some will be the same, but then it begins altering in their own particular unique way. And then that's when you get to more sophisticated interventive protocols for this, whatever symptom picture is coming up. Now, mycoplasma happens to be one of my favorite organisms that's about the tiniest bacteria uh, known to human beings. And one thing that I think is fascinating about it is that um, probably 40 years of laboratory research using Petri dishes 
um, has turned out to be really suspect because they didn't even know that mycoplasma existed then. They couldn't really see it in the microscopes, and it turned out most of the Petri dishes were infected with mycoplasma organisms. So whatever outcomes they had been getting from their in vitro research has turned out to be, in a lot of instances, suspect. So it's a fascinating organism, but nevertheless also somewhat straightforward to treat if you just kind of know it's there. Yeah, that's very interesting. Very interesting point. So when people are dealing with uh, co-infections, for example, do you generally suggest that they also have the core Lyme protocol in place before they start adding in some of these other things for maybe Bartonella or Babesia, or do some people uh, not need the core protocol? Well, you know, that's kind of one of those, like you start to get into the whole Lyme thing and the different, you know, there's a lot of different uh, treatment strategies that have been put out there by different people and different groups. And, 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 you know, when you start really getting into it, there starts to be a lot of, let's say, feelings begin to run rather high. So there's, you know, the one thing I'm always suspicious of is a universalist insistence on this thing always happens has, has to happen first because that's not the way life really works um, for every person that can get well on a macrobiotic diet there's another person who gets well eating at mcdonald's every day so it's complicated my approach and my partner julie mcintyre who's done the most clinical work much more than I have, the, our approach is always the same thing. What's the primary symptom picture? What's the most dominant symptom that is troubling the person? And you kind of get through a series, and you might make a list of what these things are, and those, the symptoms determine the approach. Now, in general, we'll always recommend Japanese knotweed as a primary um, starting herb because it shuts down so many inflammation processes for so many of the co-infectious bacteria that in general, that one herb will help reduce as sort of a general, it's like chicken soup, you know, and <laughs> it really begins to help right away. But so barring that, even though, or just aside from that, what's the primary specific symptom? If it's arthritis, it'll be this thing or if it's um, brain fog or if it's, you know, uh, the neural network and the brain is starting to shut down. That's the, the most important thing because the people that come in, they're afraid, they're suffering, they don't know what to do, they don't know where to turn. And many of them have never used herbs before. So what you need to do is find the one thing that you can shift most immediately for them that will help them begin to feel better because as soon as they do, it will rekindle hope. They'll start to have faith in the medicine. They'll start to have faith in the person who's helping them. They'll start to actually believe for the first time that they might get well and they're not acting then so much from desperation as from a belief that they actually have a future. And that shift alone makes a massive difference. And I, I personally am very unclear about why so many practitioners just won't look at the person in front of them and work with the most acute symptom rather than trying to put some sort of blanket protocol on people and say, yeah, just take it anyway and you'll be, you know, after a while you'll start to feel better. I want them to start feeling better within two or three days, four days, five days. And quite often, if you're focused that way, you'll get that kind of shift almost immediately. And that gives you space to work on a lot of the more long-term issues that are much more difficult to turn around. Yeah, and that shift that you talked about as well, where people feel hopeful, they uh, believe that they can move forward and, and really get their life um, to a better place. I mean, I think that uh, is probably as important as any of the medicines or herbs or anything we can take in terms of really helping us to move forward. It's crucially important. I mean, the I think that the rapport and 
caring relationship that's established between the practitioner and the ill person and the rekindling of that hope are absolutely two of the most important things. And yet those are quite often the two things that most healers, no matter what their paradigm, are the least trained in being able to do. And amongst technological physicians, it's... um, (laughs) It, it's virtually absent unless you just happen to run into somebody that's really uh, mm-hmm. tends to go in that direction. So, yeah, we found it. And, you know, I worked as a clinician, as a psychotherapist and over decades, and I found that that one thing, that that dynamic makes the biggest difference of all. Yeah, I agree. It's very important. So one of the things over the years, you know, I personally and others that I've spoken with have used various complex herbal formulations with 10 or 12 different herbs from various herbalists and companies that have products for Lyme. And some of these will have astragalus in them. And so I often get the question from people, well, you can't use that. Stephen Buhner says you can't use astragalus if you have Lyme disease. And so I'm interested in your thoughts on that. Is there is there a difference between between you know that being a component of a more complex herbal versus just taking lots of astragalus from the perspective of the concerns that you've raised, right? And that's really, I mean, a lot of a lot of herbalists are mad at me about that particular thing because you know the thing that I found is that the point I was trying to get across is that if you're using astragalus as a primary interventive in Lyme, there was a real chance that it would actually make the condition worse. And I've heard from people over the years that took astragalus for whatever reason and their symptom picture did get worse. So that was the point I was trying to make. And I, again, that first book wasn't as sophisticated as later. And I have more of a caveat about this in the second one. In general, if there's astragalus as a component of a blend where there's that many herbs in it, it's going to have a negligible effect because it's in this matrix of other herbs. So it, you're not, astragalus is a really good herb to help prevent the onset of Lyme or to prevent the symptom picture being a bad one. So you can take it in massive quantities. It's a food grade herb. And it's a really great thing if you're in a Lyme endemic area to just pretty much live on it as a food substance. You know, you make a tea, make your rice from that or your soup stock or whatever. It's great. But, you know, the caution that I was urging is that if you've got an acute Lyme dynamic happening and you take a lot of astragalus, it can in fact cause the symptom picture to get worse. And this is where I'm in a conflict with a number of especially Chinese herbalists because they look at astragalus simply as an immune modulating herb and in many ways it is but it also tends to have some amount of immune stimulant dynamic depending upon the circumstances and that was the thing that I was more concerned with so in general that's sort of the answer if it's blended in with a bunch of other things fine if it is a major kind of herb that you're using, I exercise caution. And is it true then that the exacerbation of symptoms that it might produce can occur in both people that are fairly recently infected as well as those that are more chronically infected, or is it more of an issue for the the more chronic scenario? Well, that's a really good question. Um, With people that are chronic, I tend to go toward different immune modulators than astragalus, okay. um, more specifically ashwagandha, because one of the things that happens in the cytokine cascade that's created in the body, so when the organisms get in there, they stimulate certain kinds of cellular inflammation to allow them to get through Um, cellular barriers deeper in the body and also because it breaks apart cellular structures that they can then use those parts that are left as their foods and their nutrient substances. So, and one of the ways that they deal with this, one of the, an interleukin um, 10 is an herb, is a cytokine basically that what 
it's meant to do is it's meant to dampen inflammation processes in the body. And so when we get sick, we'll have an acute episode and there's a lot of inflammation in the body, which we can experience as fever, for instance. And that helps combat the bacterial infection and stealth infections have learned how to use that process for their own benefit. That's why they're very clever. And and one of the things that happens, so we get this acute thing, inflammation goes high, but as we begin to get well, the body begins to release IL-10, which will dampen the inflammation. And one of the things that happens with these guys is that they constantly suppress IL-10 emergence in the body, which ashwagandha is really good at bringing that up, which will lower inflammation parameters in the body. And so it's much more of a specific modulator for chronic Lyme, in my opinion. It's it's pretty important. I would say it's probably the number one important herb for um, modulating immune function in chronic Lyme. And the other advantage for a lot of people is it helps stimulate sleep So because sleep disturbance is real common in Lyme as well. So I tend to go toward that herb rather than astragalus for chronic Lyme. And I think astragalus blended into other things in chronic Lyme can be useful as long as it's fairly low dose. Okay, very, very good. So let's build on, you talked about ashwagandha from an immune modulation perspective. And another another thing that I often hear people say is I need to do something to boost my immune system. And I think that that's probably not really an accurate representation that in Lyme there are aspects of the immune system that are already potentially overactive and maybe there's other aspects of the immune system that are underactive and so I think the the important concept is what you're talking about here about modulating or bringing into balance rather than just boosting so you mentioned ashwagandha are there some other herbs that are in your favorite list in terms of modulation of the immune response yeah they are I mean eleutherococcus it used to be called Siberian ginseng and cat's claw does provide a fair amount of that Rhodiola and cordyceps do as well, and they're more subtle, I think. Um, I think a lot of what people mean when they say they want to boost their immune system is they're all they're really talking about wanting to boost their vitality levels. Um, you know, kind of what we've all experienced this, we get sick so or we get the flu or something, and we feel tremendously fatigued. And in part, part of the reason for that is that our all of our reserves in our body are going into immune function to try to deal with the disease. They don't really have time for us to want to go dancing or go to the movies or something like that. And so there's this kind of a loss of vitality, a loss of energy, and people think, oh, oh, if I can only boost my immune system, it could blow the disease out, and then I could have all this energy again and all this stuff. And so under some circumstances, I do think that that's really important to do especially in people that are incredibly depleted. So, you know, Eleutherococcus syntacosis, it, the Russians sort of pioneered its use in this very strong formulation. Of, I mean, you can get it one to two, one to one, two to one even sometimes. In these formulations, the herbal tincture is about black. It's a very dark color. It's good for some people to use that in moderate to largest doses doses early on just simply to start to bring back vitality if they're extremely worn down and fatigued. Um, I actually prefer if you're using Eleutherococcus for long-term modulation, it's really much better at a one to five, in which case the tincture will be a golden color. Um, and it takes about six months before it really begins to kick in. But you'll notice that there's a very, very gradual enhancement of energy level, vitality, resistance to the uh, disease fluctuations. Their skin color will get better. Their eyes will, will start to sparkle a little more. And by the end of a year, usually it's a very good thing like that. But it's a longer, slower process. Um, but yeah, I, I look at it as for most people, the necessity is to modulate slowly over time and just alter the whole uh, cytokine dynamics. But occasionally, sometimes um, a jolt of something like those really strong eleutherococcus really is indicated just simply because 
when you get more energy and more vitality that way, you've got more hope and you feel better. Yeah, very, very good. So building on immune modulation and reducing inflammation, there's a lot of conversation these days about mast cell activation and the overproduction of histamine in the body and people looking for solutions to help stabilize mast cells, which can be a factor in a lot of the symptoms that people experience. Are there any herbal options that come to mind that might help with stabilizing mast cells or reducing histamines in the body? Well, there are. I mean, there's a tremendous number because, you know, plants suffer inflammation just the way we do. So from the same sort of causes and mast cells and inflammation is a problem they have as well. And so, I mean, sort of one of the interesting ways there were some physicians that were beginning to use some things that would lower mast cells and they noticed um, a real um, benefit to it. And so my partner, Julie McIntyre, has really focused a lot on that. And I, I do list in the second edition of Healing Lyme on page 226 a lot about that. But and there's probably most herbs can do that. I mean, um, Japanese knotweed will, for instance, and a lot of them. But really, um, Julie's found two things most specific for that. And the first one is butterbur, which is... Um, uh, at 50 milligrams three times daily. And that one is pretty much her go-to for that as an adjunct. And probably the next one is inositol. And then um, there's a whole lot of other herbs that can be explored for that, which will really help. But uh, yeah, butterbur, which is potassetes, um, uh, it, it's pretty good for that. And so is inositol. That's great. Thank you. Thank you for offering those. Yeah. So let's just get your thoughts a little bit on detoxification. I mean, practitioners, they incorporate different types of charcoals and clays and zeolites. They're trying to help people reduce their body burden of metals and chemicals and pesticides and so on. How do we, from an herbal perspective, best support the body's ability to detoxify? Well, that's, um, you know, we're getting into to an area of detoxification is kind of like it almost starts to get into the parasite, you know, conversation, which is there's this massive sort of thing going through the um, world community in the West about, oh, I have to get rid of the parasites or I have to detoxify from all this stuff. And yeah, sometimes it's really true, but I think there's I'd almost have to classify it as a mass hysteria about the necessity. There's a, a drive toward a certain kind of purification, which I think comes out of a really unique Protestant Puritan historical orientation. And I think detoxification belief can go a bit too far. So I'm more cautious about that. Nevertheless, um, in some instances, it really does help tremendously and probably you know the major things that we've been using are you know zeolite um, charcoal chlorella I mean in green clay is a lot of people are using that internally there's a lot of things that can really help you know I talk about that in the second edition of healing Lyme on page 234 really it's under Herxheimer reactions to sort of help because in a way, those come from bacterial die-off in the body, and so it helps sort of get rid of that flotsam and jetsam of whatever toxic substances are in the body. But really, those for zeolites probably top on the list, and generally, we're using a liquid 15 drops three to four times a day. Powder will work too, but these things can really help. But again, we tend to rely at their use on specific symptom picture and sort of just past history, you know, of what people have been exposed to. Very good. So, yeah, no, that's helpful. I always appreciate your insights. They're, they're uh, wonderful to hear. Let's talk a little bit about... Uh, 
people that are treating Lyme disease with antibiotics, one of the challenges with that seems to be that the microbes can more readily develop resistance to these synthetic compounds, which um, the herbal options, they're, they're more complex. There's more components to the plant compounds than there are to some of the synthetic options. And so I'm just wondering how much of an issue is resistance to herbs? Is it important to rotate herbs to minimize resistant? Uh, and do people with Lyme become resistant to herbal therapies over time like they do some of the pharmaceutical options or not? Yeah, we're getting into another area which is starting to have a lot of uh, hyperactivity. Um, in general, no, people don't. The organisms don't develop resistance to herbal um, remedies or protocols the way they do there. But there's some caveats with that. Um, part of it is that um, you know, so bacteria do develop resistance to plant antimicrobials, but what happens is the plants then analyze the resistance mechanism and then they create a workaround or a response to it that will inactivate what the bacteria have done. That's why there can never really be such thing as a standardized herbal medicine because the plants are always innovating. So that's why then, you know, the you need to keep having plants that are new, that are healthy, that are wild, that are being um, cultivated in a way which allows them to constantly work with that. And usually if they're in combination, they're so synergistic that it's very difficult for the organisms to resist sort of three plants working together, you might say. The one thing that we have noticed that's been happening is the organisms are definitely becoming more insistent. Now, some people will talk about it in terms of they're getting stronger, but we really think of it in terms of they're becoming more insistent because you have to realize all of these the infection dynamics that are running through the human organisms now, the human culture, are fulfilling a specific ecological function. And when we try to look at it in an isolated way, like, oh, we can just, keep this barrier, a sort of technological barrier, or pharmaceutical barrier around ourselves to allow us to, uh, you know, infinitely increase population and do all of this stuff. What is happening is that there's pressure on the human population to really reduce its numbers and its negative impact on the ecosystem. And n we're never going to escape that. It's impossible. So you might say they're working with more insistence. The microbes are to force alterations in the human um, functioning. And so it is taking sometimes larger doses to deal with some of these organisms. Um, it's sometimes taking uh, much more sophisticated herbal combinations to deal with them because as we create these protocols to treat Lyme, they're not stupid. They're analyzing what we're doing and they begin to alter their their behavioral dynamics to get around our workarounds, so to speak. And so they're, you, again, they're 4 billion years old, very smart. We've been around a million years, let's say, to give us more credit than we're due. And we're, we're just, we have to be as adept as they are in our responses. So it's, a, it's not exactly an easy yes or no answer like you were looking for, but I hope that sort of covered the complexity of the process and the situation. Yeah, it did. Um, just to kind of clarify, though, would we say that we're in agreement that plant compounds are less likely to develop resistance than synthetic antibiotics, for example? It seems to me that yeah. that's the case. Okay. Much less, much less likely, and in some instances, it's just a blanket absolute, and right. in others, it's not, but less likely is a good way to go. So in terms of the impact on herbs on the microbiome, we know with antibiotics, one of the downsides is that they can have a negative effect on the beneficial flora within the gastrointestinal tract and really reduce the diversity of that flora. And I'm wondering, is there an impact on the beneficial flora when we're using these antimicrobial herbs, or does that not have a negative impact on the, the beneficial flora? I think it depends on the herb and it depends on the dose. 
Now, you know, my partner, Julie, and I are having a, a kind of a long-term, you know, very refined and uh, civilized argument on this point about cryptolepis, whether it does exactly alter the biome um, structure in the gut if you're using it in large doses for treating resistant staph, for instance. I don't really think it does. She does think it does. So, you know, the jury's sort of out on that. And I tend to look at the Africans who use it daily for years and years and years and maintain a really good biome health. So I think it's more um, an individual circumstance that um, it depends on the biome health and structure of the person when they come in. And as you know, most Americans, their GI tract is extremely screwed up just simply from the exposure to so many um, antibiotics over their lifetime. And so there's a lot of um, good recognition now that biome structure and health affects consciousness, it affects brain function and overall health and vitality. So, you know, what Julie does a lot is focus on restoration of biome health, and then it seems that the herbs have a lot less tendency to disrupt it. So easy answer would be if it's already disrupted, they can disrupt it more depending on the herb. If it's not disrupted very much, then it doesn't really matter what the herb is. It's not going to tend to disrupt it very okay. much after that. Yeah, very, very good. So we know that um, there's stories in the news all the time about contaminants in different herbs from other countries and so on. Are there a few key companies that feel that you feel really live up to your standards in terms of providing quality product that people should gravitate towards? Right, and I list them in the book, and I've always tried to do that. I mean, you know, Woodland Essence has been probably the first one that I began suggesting. Montana Pharmacy's good. Greed Dragon Botanicals. And if people are getting whole herbs, Zach Woods Herb Farm, Healing Spirits, and Pacific Botanicals for whole herbs directly from people, those are the, the really the six top companies altogether that I recommend. Perfect. Thank you. When people say they don't tolerate herbs, which I've heard from some people, is there a specific reason that a person wouldn't tolerate herbs in general? Are those people more likely to have phenolic sensitivities or is it potentially related to herbs that have oxalates and and then just more generally how common is it that someone doesn't tolerate herbs to me it seems to be fairly infrequent but what is your observation it's very infrequent um it's mostly we see it in people with that have multiple chemical sensitivities of some sort or are people that are developing a sort of autistic response to Lyme. Or, in, in some ways, we might say, I guess the way I put it in the book, about 1% of the people that we've had experience with have an absolutely intense sensitivity to herbal medicines. And so the dosage range for them tends to be very tiny. One to three drops, for instance, are... With a lot of homeopathic medicines that um, will work at a much more subtle level, um, some people will have an individual response to an herbal medicine. I mean, um, that's one of the things I would always look for. Um, if I had, like, let's say three herbs I thought would be really good for this person and their symptom picture, but then I would put just like a drop on their tongue of each one, one, you know, and I would watch their physiological response. And you can really see that um, some of them, their body just has an absolute aversion to, and others, they have, a, a, you know, the opposite. They're really quite drawn to it. And um, it's just sort of the wisdom of the body is an important thing. But really, I think it's more some people, because of the nature of the Lyme, have extreme sensitivity, and then we shift dosage and herbal regimens quite considerably in those instances. Very, very good. One of my listeners has read your books, and her question was, what does Stephen Buhner eat, and what does Stephen Buhner thinks is important in terms of a focus on diet for optimizing health? Well, I'm, you know, I drive, you know, when we go to herbal gatherings, they tend to be more vegetarian than not. And so I and a number of people learn to take beef jerky with us, you know, to function. I'm a real omnivore. I eat anything. I 
it took me a long time to train my body and trust my body to eat whatever it wants. So, you know, I went through about three months of, I wanted yogurt all the time and that's what I ate. Then I hadn't eaten any bread in two years. And then for about two weeks, I just ate a lot of bread and, you know, now I'm on to other things. And that's, I tend to follow that sort of sensitivity uh, because my body knows better than my mind what it needs to eat at any particular time. Um, you know, I wrote a book on fasting, and in there I have quite a bit about diet and, uh, you know, cleansing diets and then how to come off of that and, you know, to let your GI tract sort of rest. And I do that once or twice a year myself every year. But more where I try to get to is so people can follow that sort of urging of their body toward what food or food groups that they actually really, that it wants for, you know, not not what does the tongue want, not what, is, not what does the four-year-old child want, but what does the body really want to eat that day. Right, right. Very interesting. Um, let's talk a little bit about the books. So you have several books on Lyme. You had two editions of Healing Lyme. You've got one on Bartonella and Mycoplasma. You've written one on Babesia, Ehrlichia, and Anaplasma. What are your future plans around your Lyme work, and will we see more books or projects coming from you in the future? Well, I ended up writing six incredibly technical books in 40 months, and I really burned myself out. I, I hadn't intended to do that many, but there was just a weird confluence of stars in the universe and planets, I guess, that uh, my publishers really wanted them, and so it just sort of happened that way. Um, but right now, I've taken a couple of years off, and I don't really want to write any more technical medical herbals um, for a while, and I don't know if I ever will because they're extremely demanding um, to read those many journal papers and synthesize all of that stuff. Uh, I'm working kind of in other areas uh, now, more along, um, you know, my books on uh, lost language of plants or secret teachings of plants, more sort of along those lines, really. Great. So what does Stephen Buner do to optimize your own health on a regular basis? I have as much fun as I possibly can. I mean, <laughs> you know, that, I, you know, I think a lot of um, our troubles come from not sometimes just sitting and staring in the morning at the sunrise or um, we always have to somehow keep up the goodwill in ourselves about um, joy. And so, um, I mean, I, you know, herbs are part of my life, and I'm always rotating different herbs for different reasons or different things. Um, but really having as much joy as possible, no matter what the circumstance, uh, it's really important, I think. So tell us where listeners can find you if they're interested in more information about your work and your books. Oh, if they just type my name into the internet, they'll find me. My website will come up right away, and um, it's not exactly as if I'm hard to find. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good. So I want to thank you. Um, you have had such a large impact on a suffering community. You've certainly helped to minimize the struggles that many of us with Lyme disease have faced. I certainly thank you and appreciate you. One of the listeners said, thank him for his unselfish sharing of information. He epitomizes a true giver. And another listener said, tell him I love him. So <laughs> Stephen Buner, you are a force of nature. I thank you for being here on the show today. And thanks for sharing your knowledge with us. You're welcome, Scott. Thanks for having me on. For more information on today's guest, visit GaianStudies.org. That's GaianStudies.org, spelled G-A-I-A-N Studies.org. I appreciate your support of the Better Health Guy blogcasts series. If you'd like to follow me, you can find me on Facebook and Twitter as Better Health Guy. The show can be found on YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. If you'd like to support the show, please visit betterhealthguy.com forward slash donate. And if you'd like to be added to my newsletter, please visit betterhealthguy.com forward slash newsletters. I'm looking forward to many more shows ahead and appreciate your interest. Thanks for listening to this Better Health Guy blogcast with Scott, your Better Health Guy. To check out additional shows and learn more about Scott's personal journey to better health, please visit BetterHealthGuy.com.